you know, and uh, and and we're gonna have a couple of speakers, uh, brief comments, and then we're gonna go into questions, uh, provocative questions and answers, and we have already some questions from the audience. Uh, Dr. Okolo, if you can stay for the panel, we'd be glad to have you. Uh, of course, we know that you have a lot of compromises uh, because of your of your, of your role in Wajo, but if you can stay with us, uh, we'll appreciate it. It's gonna be about an hour we're gonna have for the panel. So the first uh, speaker in the panel uh, with uh, some brief comments um, will be Dr. Luis Andres de Francisco Serpa, who is a director of the Family, Gender and Life Course Department of the Pan American Health Organization World Health Organization based in Washington. He's uh, from Colombia. He received his medical degree from the Universidad de Rosario in Bogota. He obtained a master's degree in the clinical tropical medicine, as well as a master's in community health in developing countries from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, University of London, United Kingdom. Uh, he obtained a PhD in medicine from the same university and uh, has over 30 years of ex professional experience dedicated to maternal child family planning and reproductive health in Colombia and other countries from the Americas, Eastern, East Africa, and Bangladesh. Dr. Uh, De Francisco joined WHO in 2008, and four years later, he was appointed Deputy Executive Director uh, uh, for the Partnership of, for Maternal, Newborn, and Child Health at the base in WHO. Dr. De Francisco has authored numerous publications on, on topics such as, as maternal, neonatal, and child survival and nutrition, primary health care, communicable diseases and health research and financing. He's a corresponding member of the National Academy of Medicine of Colombia and an honorary senior lecturer at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. We're also gonna have Dr. Uh, the, Dr. De Francisco is back in the Americas, in, in Washington. And then we're gonna move back to Switzerland with Dr. Uh, to, sorry, to Amsterdam with Dr. Franco, Oscar Franco, who is the director of the Institute of Social and Preventive Medicine at the University of Bern since uh, June 2018, where he's also a professor of epidemiology and public health. Oscar trained as a MD at uh, La Universidad Javeriana de Colombia. There's no bias about Colombia here, Dr. Espinal, and uh, we qualifying in 1998. Afterwards, he completed uh, his master in science and doctor in science and PhD in cardiovascular disease prevention and public health at Erasmus uh, uh, college in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. In 2006, he moved to the UK, where he worked for Unilever as senior public health epidemiologist, University of Warwick, as assistant professor in public health at the University of Cambridge, as clinical lecturer in public health. Also in the UK, he completed a clinical training in public health, and uh, he, in 2018, he moved to Erasmus as professor of preventive medicine at the Department of Epidemiology where he lead the, leads the cardiovascular epidemiology group and Erasmus H. Oscar. Uh, he has uh, over 86 uh, published papers and uh, books and uh, close to 700 papers published in peer-reviewed journals. Then we're gonna have also uh, Mr. Thomas Puni. He's the Director General of the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers, uh, the Global Association of Research-Based Pharmaceutical Companies and Associations he is based in Geneva, so thanks to the technology, we're going to be jumping from the Americas back to back to to, uh, to Europe and uh, to to Africa with Dr. Okolo. Uh, he is uh, the IFPMA has official relations with the United Nations and contributes industry expertise to help the global health community find solutions that improve global health. He is the secretary of the Biopharmaceutical and CEO Roundtable a policy forum of the global CEOs of uh, IFPMA uh, member companies. He is also chair of the business of OECD Health Committee and also serves on the board of directors of the City Cancer Challenge and initiative aiming to improve cancer care in, in major cities in low and middle income countries. In addition, Mr. Cuny serves as an industry co-chair at the APAC Biopharmaceutical Working Group uh, on Ethics and chair of the board on the cross-sectoral uh, uh, antimicrobial resistant industry alliance, a group compromising over 10, con 10 companies and associations representing um, uh, pharma, industry, generics, biotech, and diagnosis community of tackling the threat of antimicrobial resistance. He has a, a wide experience in, in, the, in, in Europe in the Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations. 
as uh, you serve in several several positions, and it's a pleasure to have you with us, sir. So we're going to go back from uh, Mexico, where I am based, to Washington to listen to Dr. Andres de Francisco Serpa for his remarks. Andres, you have the screen. Thank you very much, uh, Francisco, and greetings to Dr. Mark Rosenberg, Carlos Espinal, Tamay Guillarte. Thank you very much, for FIU, for this opportunity, colleagues. We are at a very uh, interesting time at present. We have over 100 million people infected with COVID in the world and 2.5 deaths, million deaths. And what we are talking about, I'm going to focus more on the region uh, of the Americas, which is where the Pan-American Health Organization is, is based. Um, very early on in the, in the pandemic, uh, the director of the American Health Organization did send letters in January 2020 to be uh, closer to, to, to the timing, telling heads of states about the importance of this particular uh, issue, that it was a problem that needs to be um, dealt with. We have at present over 50 million people infected in this region. This region is currently unproportionately affected with uh, the U.S. having uh, passed the tragic milestone of 500,000 uh, people who have died of complications due to COVID. So it's a major issue. Another item for this region is that we have an aging population is aging faster than any other regions in the, in, in the world, which also poses uh, communities into, uh, into risk factors. So uh, the, the, the plan here is basically saving lives, increasing awareness and being vigilant to the messages that are given that this pandemic is decreasing. Well, it is increasing in some countries, but it's not decreasing in some others, in some areas, for example, the Amazonas uh, forest areas. The, the, the team here in terms of equity is uh, the importance of COVID. It has been already been, uh, been uh, described, 2 billion doses for 2021. But let's remember that having vaccines, which we need to have, it's not the same as having people vaccinated. And here is the relevant message for countries. We are working very, very close with countries since, uh, since the beginning of the Pan-American Health Organization and immunizations very specifically, we have seen how working with countries, we have been able to control diseases like measles, uh, polio, uh, rubella, neonatal tetanus, uh, among others. But the issue here is, what are the mechanisms that we have to do that? And we are working on the preparedness uh, to receive the vaccines once they are available or once they uh, come uh, to tuition. So what we are working is with the, we started working with the vaccine readiness uh, tool, the VIRAT. At present we have in the, in the region 33 uh, countries that have uh, provided information. This is self-assessment on progress towards um, being prepared for vaccines. And an important element here is that we have the uh, revolving fund for vaccines that was created by countries in the region and is hosted at, at PAHO, which is basically providing an accelerated authorization for uh, vaccines, providing their pre qualification UL for WHO. And this actually helps to move forward some of these regulatory processes that are uh, cumbersome, in which some, some cases legis legislation has to be actually uh, modified. So this is an advantage that we have here. We also have information on importation and also on an important uh, clause that is required, which is um, uh, on indemnization and liability, which countries have to actually uh, provide if they are going to import vaccines. The second thing that we are doing is we are actually working with countries on the uh, national deployment and vaccination plans that was mentioned before. We have 10 countries in this region that are AMC, that means the recipients uh, of donation of vaccines. And in this case, 12 countries, self-financing countries have provided um, the national development plans that have been reviewed regionally by, um, by um, our, uh, our offices together with, uh, with other colleagues. This is important because this is showing not only the legal aspects that I just mentioned, but also how do these frameworks relate to other immunization activities, which we want to ensure that they don't actually 
decrease because all of the efforts are provided to, to COVID. How to look at decentralization of human resources, how to look not only at vaccination for young kids, which is traditionally the case, but I just want to tell you that during the last half of the last year, uh, 2020, there was an increase of immunization for flu in the Southern hemisphere of this region where countries with our uh, um, technical cooperation vaccinated about a hundred million people for influenza. If you would have thought that maybe 70% of coverage for the region would uh, be good, if we will look at the data from Israel to cease transmission, uh, we would be talking about seven times that effort that has been uh, undertaken. Uh, in addition to that, I think it's also important um, to put and to frame, I think, immunization within a health promotion uh, theme and the social determinants of health that Dr. Holst talked at the beginning are extremely important because if you are going to decentralize distribution of vaccination and vaccinate across the age groups, you need a very specific, um, a very specific uh, strategy to do that. We are certainly working close with the COVAX facility and on the allocation pattern that Annalise uh, talked about. Uh, I understand that some letters are going to be going to countries uh, soon. Some of them have already started to do so. And we do know that the, that the, that the allocation is very low at present, but we think that the allocation increasing at this has been uh, promised or estimated by end of March and certainly by end of 2021, if we have countries already available and able to implement and know exactly what are the requirements to cover a population at the degree that is, that is required, then we are going to be uh, moving forward uh, in tandem. Certainly it's very exciting that Ghana has already received the first doses of, of COVAX. And we do expect that there will be an increase um, in utilization of, of vaccines. But having said that, countries have to do their homework in order to be ready to receive the vaccines. I want to stress here that we need vaccines. Manufacturing is not to the level that we would like. It's catching up, fortunately, and there will be new vaccines as uh, Dr. Hoetz was presented, uh, presenting earlier on, but countries have to do the homework of making sure that we will be able to utilize these vaccines in the right way to the right people following the uh, allocation uh, 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 system that has been defined by WHO, but also looking at the mechanisms of uh, Gavi, uh, COVAX and, and CEPI. And finally, and finally, also to say, as we speak, we are launching uh, here in the region also a regional system for vigilance or IF, of IFIS. This is basically bringing all of the various uh, initiatives to look at adverse effects following immunization and uh, special interest, which are relevant certainly for the following up of the legal and regulatory processes. Things like, for example, not only uh, importation, but also uh, look at the details of the vaccines that are being uh, utilized in, in, in English. So people will be very important to ensure that uh, we do have a, a, a follow-up. And finally, the issue of communication, issue of risk communication, issues of communication uh, in which, in, in a case right now that we have that is not only providing information, it's more than that is much more than understanding what the security of the vaccines are, how to use them, how to utilize them, and finally, how to make sure that we can vaccinate everybody. Thank you very much, Francisco. Muchas gracias, Andres. Thank you so much. Now, we, from Washington, we, we move uh, to Rotterdam and uh, to listen to Dr. Franco uh, with his message. Dr. Franco, please, you have the screen and you can show your, your slides. Good afternoon, everyone, and buenas tardes. Uh, in the coming 10 minutes, I'm going to be talking about the situation in Europe. And I will start with my last slide. Uh, these are, I think, the five most important immediate challenges. We have new variants that are threatening to bring the epidemic out of control. 
this has been hampered as well by a lack of speed in the distribution and implementation of the vaccination programs in Europe, which is also hampered by an increased degree of skepticism towards the vaccines and by the economic situation that is affecting the region, and also by a lack of coordination in the responses to all of these factors. I will start talking about the variants. The first variant of prominence was uh, a new variant of prominence was reported around the 20th of February in the north of Italy. And soon the G614 variant went to replace the initial variant of the pandemic. Basically, G614 became the variant behind the pandemic during the first half of 2020. After what happened, uh, the catastrophe that occurred in Europe during the first half of 2020, we saw the summer bringing a new spirit that was taken by many as a sign of relaxation. And these were the common pictures that we saw in the summer in Europe. A lot of people travel, and a lot of people travel to the south of Europe. And in fact, I, by the end of June, a new variant, 28 EU1, was reported in the north of Spain. And it's thought that this variant was then uh, brought back to different countries throughout Europe by the people that were traveling to Spain. And this variant was behind the increases that we saw in October and November, period during which a new variant, the British variant of the variant that appeared in, in the region of Kent in England, B117, appeared, but it was only reported uh, when we heard in December, um, Boris Johnson talking about this variant and the impact that it will have in the population and that we saw happening during December and January. Currently, besides this variant, we have other variants like the variant in Manaus or the South Africa variant and others in America that are threatening and that have now spread throughout Europe, but also outside of the European region. And if we look at the situation during the last weeks, we see here a country, for example, like the Netherlands, that despite being in a lockdown and ignite curfew, when the cases started to decrease, this decrease has plateaued and now it's starting to increase. The same is occurring in countries like Germany and Denmark. And we heard recently Angela Merkel talking about how Germany is probably entering a third wave. We don't know that that perhaps what is behind this could be the variance of the relaxation of the people. If we want to look more in detail at the distribution of the variance per country, a colleague of ours in ISPM, Emma Hotcroft, have put together with collaborators this website, www.covariance.org, where you can see the distribution of the variance per time and also per country. We can see, for example, here in the United Kingdom, how the British variant went to, to really dominate the situation of the epidemic, uh, while in Denmark is increasing, and in Switzerland, it's also increasing dramatically, while in the Netherlands, it started to increase. And now a new variant, which is this that you're seeing in purple, is sharing its role together with the 28 EU1 that came from the north of Spain at the beginning of the summer. And is, uh, we need to receive more information on this new variant here in purple that is also being reported in Belgium. These variants are, uh, threat are threatening the situation of the epidemic in the region. Because besides that, what we are seeing is that the implementation of the vaccine programs in Europe is really well below what was expected. While the United Kingdom had vaccinated over 25% of its population, in Europe, the country that is doing the best is Serbia. It's the only one that comes to two digits with 12%, but the majority of the countries are around 5% or 4 or 3% in some cases. This has been because of logistic reasons. There was not, um, there were agreements that were not fulfilled. There were other vaccines that were ignored or no, were, were not authorized on time. But besides the logistic reasons, we also have a reason, which is the tendency of, the, of some countries or, or some populations in some countries in Europe to be skeptic about receiving the vaccine. We see, for example, in France, how approximately half of the population, even if they had the vaccine, the news just wouldn't allow it to be um, inoculated into it. Another situation that we're seeing in Europe is, for example, in Germany, there has been a lot of rejection towards a particular vaccine, which is the vaccine from AstraZeneca and Oxford. We see how, despite that Germany has 1.5 million approximately doses that had arrived to Germany, only 189,000 have been administered. This has been the case because some countries in Europe have emitted a uh, notification that there was a lack of information about the effectiveness of this vaccine in over 65 years old and therefore advocated not to be utilized in this population. This has generated a lot of confusion in the population and a population that is already affected by a month of pandemic with mental health issues and being affected by an economic situation that is really well below what was expected. 
In January 2020, the IMF forecasted a growth of 3.3 for the world in terms of GDP. The European area was expected to grow up 1.3. 10 months later, we see a contraction of the economy that is above what has been registered in many countries in the last 200 or 300 years. And we see the European area together with the Latin American area having been impacted economically quite severely. This is larger than the impact that had the economic crisis of 2008. And this impact lasted for approximately one decade. So we need to keep in mind that this is gonna affect health because the dichotomy of economy or health is really not necessary, it's superfluous. Economy needs health and health needs economy. So to end, I think it's very important in the region and this permits to the world that we need to improve our geno genomic vigilance. We need to understand how the mutations are occurring, how the variants are forming, and how do we respond to it and how do the vaccine programs can respond to it. We need to also improve the distribution and availability of vaccines. And we need to do a better job as public health scientists and workers in communicating to people and explaining why it's so important to obtain this vaccination, why is it good, and uh, talk in a clear manner what could be the pros and cons of being vaccinated. We need to start working heavily on the economic recovery. I think it's very important, especially for the younger generations that are about to enter the labor market. These generations are gonna suffer greatly and we already see a big impact on the mental health of the population. Also, what we have seen so far in the European region has been a disaggregated, really a heterogeneous response to the pandemic. And I think towards the future, we need a more coordinated response. This heterogeneity in how uh, travel policies, schools, economy, and all of the above is actually done has occurred between countries, but also within countries. Now, since I still have one or two minutes left, I would like to talk to you about what I think is the sixth priority. We have seen throughout multiple populations, what are the risk factors for hospitalizations or severity or mortality of COVID-19. We have heard of age, gender, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, Data this week from Tufts University, from the team of uh, Darius Mosafarian, show how approximately of all hospitalizations in the U.S., 63% has some level of cardiovascular risk. These are diseases that are not appear uh, suddenly, but are actually generated by the lifestyle and behavior of the population. And this is important because we know that people are confined, people are uh, having anxiety, uh, having problems of sleeping, and we need to improve physical activity, dietary factors, etc. Why? Because this is how people get uh, better response to the disease or better evolution of the disease. It has shown that this lifestyle factor modifies the response of the individuals towards the vaccine and also helps to pandemic preparation. And very importantly, I think countries not only need to prepare themselves to get populations being vaccinated, but prepare the individuals to receive vaccination and have the best experience of it. I think it's essential that we prepare the lifestyle and behavior of the population for this crisis, but for the real crisis that we are gonna be living in the next decades, which is the issues related to planetary health. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Dr. Franco. Thank you so much, Dank. Uh, and now we move to Central uh, Europe, back to Geneva with Dr. Thomas Cooney, who's gonna be speaking uh, right now. So Dr. Cooney, you have the screen. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, please go ahead. You have uh, 10 minutes the most. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very pleased to be with you and just listening to Dr. Franco as wondering what impact lockdowns have on our fitness and the cardiovascular risk factors, which we just heard, because I saw that last summer, for example, in my country, people got on their bikes, they went out and walked, but since October, by and large, we haven't been allowed to do much of that and the fitness clubs are closed and therefore I'm sure there will be studies on it. But also hearing quite often over the last few weeks, people you know, being disappointed, being expressing anger that we don't see faster rollout of vaccines, that we don't see faster uh, scaling up of capacity. I think it is a moment, and this is quite timely, your meeting, to also recognize that we have reason to celebrate. Now, this week, of course, was 
the COVAX day on Wednesday, we had a COVAX coordination meeting on Wednesday, where we together celebrated the first rollout to Ghana, the first COVID-19 vaccines uh, delivered and deployed through UNICEF to Ghana. We have also actually today, while we talk, I think the FDA is deliberating on another COVID-19 vaccine to be approved. And I recall back in May, June last year, most people who knew about vaccine development, who knew about the risks associated with it, they said, if we get significant vaccines by the summer 21, we can be lucky. Now, when you look at that, we now already have two messenger RNA vaccines approved. And I recall when I was at the power meeting in uh, autumn, uh, Dr. Hotes said, I'm a taker for any vaccine which exceeds the 50% efficacy rate. Who at that time would have expected we have two vaccines with more than 90% efficacy rates? And that actually one of the reasons we have seen a bit of apprehension and take up in Germany or France or others is not just miscommunication, but it is that if you have several vaccines with 90 plus percent efficacy rates, uh, people are a bit more hesitant to take one which only, only has 70 percent. Therefore, I think we really need to be realistic and we need to acknowledge that amazing progress has been made in science. I was on Tuesday at the media briefing with the UN Press Corps in Geneva, uh, with Jim Robinson from CEPI, and he is really an expert in vaccine manufacturing, a 35-year veteran, and he said he would never have expected that vaccine capacity this year could exceed 6 billion. And when he was asked why, he said, I would never have expected that the messenger RNA vaccines will work. If you imagine that back in the early 90s, the research started, the concept was there, but until 2020, none of the companies had a single sale, a single sellable product. And now all of us are keeping our fingers crossed that we will get out of the pandemic because of that. And we also, I think, have to acknowledge that uh, the success which we have seen over the last you know, few months at amazing speed is also due to unprecedented collaboration, not only with the industry, but the industry with international organizations, but also efforts of regulatory agencies. When I look at how the FDA, EMA, PMDA, and the International Conference of Regulatory Medicines Agency have responded working 24 seven, and just recently coming out with a workshop talking about how do we respond to the variants? How do we make sure that these vaccines which are tweaked to respond to the variants which we are concerned, the new virus strains, don't have to undergo the full clinical trial process, phase one, phase two, phase three, but are basically treated like an adaptation of a seasonal flu vaccine. I think we have to acknowledge the extraordinary efforts there. The second one, and I said this when we met last time, this is not business as usual. And one really needs to be, you know, I personally believe one needs to under promise and over deliver and the problem is that we moved sort of from concern about vaccine hesitancy to euphoria about, oh my God, we already have the vaccines, to now vaccine anger and vaccine panic, because somehow many people thought that once you have these vaccines approved, you push a button and the billions of doses are rolling out. I just this morning had a meeting where we talked about the scale of the challenge. Global vaccine capacity pre-COVID-19 is estimated at 3.5 billion doses per year for all the vaccines combined. We are now talking about the need for 10 billion plus doses of COVID-19 vaccine, which means a tripling of vaccine capacity almost instantaneously from zero to 10 billion. It shouldn't be a surprise that this does pose challenges. We have seen efforts within the industry, for example, more recently companies who are not traditional vaccine manufacturers like Novartis, like Bayer, 
or companies whose projects were delayed, like Sanofi, like GSK, coming in and rendering support to others who are there. We have also seen an extraordinary effort in collaboration within COVAX. And I think we do see, we hear, and I hear at least once a week, Dr. Tedros complaining about the moral injustice, that we don't have an immediate equitable rollout of the vaccine. But I think we also have to be fair that this will be the first global pandemic ever, where within less than three months of the first vaccine approved PQ by WHO, and not a vaccine easy to handle when you think about the ultra cold change, has been rolled out to Ghana. But also when you look at actually uh, rollout and successful, Israel was mentioned, but when I look at it, Chile is much ahead of, for example, my country, Switzerland. Therefore, that is extraordinary. But the challenge of this tripling of production should, as we expected, does come with bottlenecks, with bumps. I think when you look back in November, companies forecast potentially a vaccine output of 500 million doses in December. When you look at how many doses actually were manufactured in December, it was about 20 million. Therefore, we have to realize that vaccine manufacturing is a very complex biological process, that the yields which you get cannot be taken for granted. We have to realize that, for example, the glass vial capacity, global one, is 5 billion, which meant single dose we now have the need for 10 billion doses of vaccines. You have to realize that the mRNA manufacturing process is very complex. The manufacturing of the RNA is complex. You need the lipid bubbles, which are not available unlimited. You need the specialized glass. You need the filters. You have multiple examples of where bottlenecks can occur. And one which was just recently discussed is most of these vaccines are produced in single-use bioreactors. You need giant plastic bags, and suddenly you realize there's not a surplus of giant plastic bags. I want to mention that we are deeply sensitive from the manufacturers to this. We do collaborate, for example, with the developing country vaccine manufacturer, and we have recently, and actually that's the reason I will need to have a hard stop here in this meeting, we have sent out invitations just yesterday for a global COVID-19 vaccine supply chain and manufacturer summit, which we, IFPMA, will co-host with CEPI, with COVAX, Gavi, WHO, with our developing country colleagues and with Bio, because we do feel that no stone should be left untouched. We do need to look at what are the scarcity in terms of raw materials, which are unavoidable. What are bottlenecks which are caused by compensatory behaviors such as hoarding? What are bottlenecks, for example, which are caused by export restrictions, export controls, and only collectively? If we build a coalition of the willing, of course, respecting antitrust compliance, we can really make the impossible happen, scale up the vaccine manufacturing as we want. And I just heard Dr. Franco express his concern about vaccine hesitancy. We, for example, uh, this week launched a digital vaccine confidence campaign, and I was extremely pleased among the many partners and testimonials we got in this campaign was Pope Francis. Uh, and if you know the Vatican's, you know, uh, science uh, ethics, it's not a clear cut that the Vatican supports taking vaccines which have been developed using, for example, stem cell lines and things like that. I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to talk to you and back to you, Dr. Bissell. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur. Very, very interesting to listen to what the industry is doing. We really appreciate your participation and uh, the sensitivity of all these issues. We're going to go now to the discussion panel and uh, thank you so much for staying with us. Uh, I know that Dr. Peter Hartz has uh, some engagement that he has to leave uh, before anybody else. So I would like to, Dr. Hartz, are you there? Because uh, we don't see you on the screen. Um, 
if if not, we're going to start first with uh, one question to Dr. De Francisco, Andres. Uh, one one of the issues here that uh, it's important is how, when we see the the implementation of vaccines through Gavi, and that the slide that Dr. Hotz presented that the enormous uh, decrease in cases of uh, vaccine preventable diseases from 2000 to 2019. It's amazing. However, we come to the pandemic in 2020, and that has had an impact on immunization programs in the world. How do you think, from the PAHO perspective, having one of the best regions with vaccination coverage in the world, how is the pandemic going to impact the traditional and uh, permanent vaccine programs in the world, and especially in the region of the Americas? Andres. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Francisco. That's a very important question. I mean, first of all, I should say that the uh, immunization program around the world, and that's basically for the basic immunization, the EPI, has had reductions in coverage throughout countries, and that's very well documented. Um, unfortunately, even though there has been very strong uh, advocacy and investments made, we have seen throughout the world um, um, a, a decrease. And part of this is lack of priority by uh, policymakers. It's also funding um, um, decreases and and. Um, and, and issues related to that. Um, uh, in, um, um, in the, and this is before COVID, so uh, there have been very strong efforts in the region of the Americas, as you know, uh, measles was actually, there was this, 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 um, a, a reduction of transmission of measles and certification of the region, which subsequently uh, had to have an additional effort to regain that certification of being free of measles. And at present, we only have one country in the region that is that is still with, with, with this transmission. So that comes to show the lack of prioritization and immunization, uh, a prioritization in financing of immunization programs, the public health programs, the bread and butter of public health, which in a way has been left a little bit uh, outside for other, for other elements. Now, the issue here is that we have COVID and COVID requires a series of measures. We have spoken about that social distancing masks and uh, uh, among others. And then is the issue of the vaccine and people tend to think, okay, vaccine, therefore immunization programs, therefore vaccination uh, against uh, uh, COVID. That is partly the case, but not exclusively. So it's very important that we keep and maintain the immunization programs uh, uh, going on. The problem is that coverage of immunization has reduced and we have documented this to up to one third, depending on what antigens you are talking about, because people are not going to the facilities. At the beginning was that the people didn't have, the, they, they were scared more, uh, or the, the people in the facility didn't have the vaccines. And then was that people didn't want to go there because they were worried of being transmitted uh, COVID. And therefore we have set some guidelines in order to make it safe for vaccination. But I think the issue here, uh, um, Francisco, is how can we understand that the immunization program is one thing, the regular immunization program, and the immunization for COVID vaccines has to be another element, an additional element that has to be included. If it's not the case, both of them are going to suffer. We are going to have subsequent epidemics of missiles polio, uh, rubella, and all of the other uh, immunopreventable diseases, which, uh, which we have actually made a lot of progress, uh, not only in the region, but around the world, in order to, uh, to reduce them. Gracias. Thanks so much. Dr. Hertz, we'll come back to you, sir, because you, you, you mentioned something very interesting, which uh, science has proven that uh, when needed, we can move from uh, research uh, platforms that were already established for other vaccines very quickly to a COVID-19 vaccine. So this is very important, but, but I think probably in this rush to have the vaccines, we missed an uh, enormous opportunity for communication and the correct communication to the community. 
how these vaccines, they didn't come from just pull them out of the sleeve because they, they were already based on strong research-based evidence on other vaccines. Do you think that this lack of communication, which part of it is the pharma industry, part of it might be WHO, is part of the hesitancy that we have seen in some places against COVID-19 vaccines? Yeah, well, thank you for that question. I think there's there's two components to this. One, certainly on the U.S. side, the, the communication was... It wasn't even awful. It just wasn't there. It was non-existence. There was no communication plan for Operation Warp Speed by design. It was left to the pharma CEOs, who generally speaking were poor communicators, um, and and that left a vacuum. And the vacuum, of course, is filled by what's become a globalized anti-vaccine and anti-science movement. Um, there are now the, more than 480 fake anti-vaccine websites um, all revved up on on social media. Um, the 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 e-commerce companies and the social media companies, the techs, have done the minimum possible to show some level of corporate social responsibility without really doing much of anything. I mean, if you go to Amazon.com and you put books up at the top and you go to the books on vaccinations after going through health, fitness, and dieting. It's all fake anti-vaccine books, all COVID conspiracy books. Amazon is the leading promoter of fake anti, anti-vaccine, anti-science uh, information. And they know it and they've been informed and they don't care. And so this is, this is a problem. And, and now, of course, we have state actors involved and, and that's new. I mean, we've now, now what was an anti-vaccine movement in the US expanded to Western Europe, to European capitals, you had, rallies in Berlin where there was an attempt to storm the Reichstag, the German parliament, that that as started as anti-vaccine, anti-mask rallies, and then linked to QAnon. And then nobody wants to do anything about the Russian government, which US and British intelligence report uh, are um, the le- leading promoters of what they what's now called weaponized health communication. And so this was both, and that, and that's sort of ironic that that the Russian government is shocked that people are criticizing the Gamalaya adenovirus vaccine when, in fact, they are the single largest promoters of fake anti-vaccine inf- information. So, about the most disingenuous uh, uh, thing you can imagine. So, so the problem is we have to somehow develop a global appetite to do something about it, and. This, the focus instead has been saying, well, we've got to rev, rev up our communication. We have to amplify our message. We've got to fine tune our communication. And I think those are fine. And I've been on Zoom calls all 2020 about how we fine tune the message, get the message out. And then I say something very provocative, but which I'm, which is heartfelt, which is that your communications, uh, your messages are messages in bottles floating in the Atlantic Ocean because you're not doing anything about the ocean. Uh, you're being drowned out by a massive onslaught by design of misinformation and disinformation. And until we take, and now it's globalized, it's become a full-on anti-science empire. And until we show an appetite or resolve to do something about this, this will continue. And um, I've been pushing hard on the Biden administration to create an interagency task force that includes the CDC. The problem is, you know, the CDC has maintained their position that um, this is not a problem, it's a fringe group. And that if we talk about it, we'll just give it oxygen. And, and I say, look, that was true 20 years ago, but now all your ideas happened before something called the internet came along and social media. Now it's that horse has left the barn. We've got to ramp, ramp that up. We've got to bring in State Department. We have to bring in uh, the Department of Commerce, uh, Homeland Security, Justice Department. And then the UN agencies have to show an appetite to do it as well. And it can't just be the World Health Organization. It's got to be, go across the UN agencies. And, and it makes people very uncomfortable. Uh, especially, you know, in my field of academia, we don't think this way, right? This is not, this is not in our DNA. But, uh, you know, I, I see the ant- this globalized anti-science empire as a bigger threat, uh, as as things like uh, 
uh, global terrorism or, 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 or others and which we have a, or nuclear proliferation and we have mechanisms in place to diffuse that so far we've not caught up with, with the anti-science empire. Dr. Hertz, thank you so much. We really appreciate your participation in, in, in this uh, session. We know you have to go because you have another commitment. So let me go back now with Dr. Wilder Smith, uh, working from SAGE in, in, in your SAGE role uh, right now. And, and I think there's a, an issue here in terms of uh, COVAX deployment of vaccines is linked to SAGE decision-making of approval for vaccines or the pre-qualification of vaccines for other countries to receive it. Do you think that this uh, delay and this uh, delay from other countries with uh, strange uh, regulatory, uh, regulatory agencies approving first the vaccines and SAGE taking longer time to approve them is linked to the delay of COVAX deployment? Do you think that this could have been speed up? Dr. Willis Smith, you're on mute. All right. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> the most frequent sentence you are on mute. Um, so, so um, indeed, the SAGE process is very closely linked to either an emergency use listing, and the emergency use listing is, is I must admit, there are some delays, or it's linked to a stringent regulatory authority, which means it's bit biased towards the Western, the Western um, vaccines that have gone through stringent uh, regulatory authorities. However, I don't think we, we should skip corners and, and say, you know, we don't, we don't want a, a very stringent review and just go out with the vaccines, which has happened. A lot of vaccine deals and negotiations and rollout has happened before any um, any very stringent reviews have been done. So, so I would I would say we need to continue stringent reviews. We 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 need to um, probably uh, fund WHO better in their pre qualification processes so we can speed up those processes. But we should not cut corners. And and the world the world does not want to see us cut corners. And I think even if we lose a few weeks uh, here we will gain them in confidence. Now you are on mute. No, I, yes, thank you. I think that this is important <laughs> that what you were saying, and I think that this is uh, related to a lot of issues in terms of bilateral agreements, emergency uh, uh, approval of the vaccines, and, and some countries are getting very good vaccines. So let's say they have, they're getting vaccines. As Dr. Hertz say, I will get whatever vaccine is there available. And uh, I was luckily, uh, and I say luckily because in Mexico we were starting the vaccination and uh, two days ago I had my first shot of uh, the Russian vaccine, the Sputnik. And uh, so thinking on this, get whatever vaccine is there. Uh, and uh, uh, do you think that this is, is a missed opportunity in some countries to make a follow-up of all these vaccines being introduced and several vaccines introduced in a country like Mexico in which we have already have Pfizer, we have uh, um, AstraZeneca, we have Gamaliel, and we have Sinovac, and we have Cancino. So we're going to have a, a, at least five different vaccines. And I think that this is a very good example of how we're losing the opportunity to make a follow-up of all these different vaccines and how they behave in real life uh, with large amount of populations, thousands and thousands of people, more than any phase three trial. This is going to be a kind of phase four trial, real life, and we're losing the opportunity to follow up the efficacy in terms of cases, in terms of hospitalization, and in terms of vets. How can WHO support countries to do these kind of studies and support the world to understand efficacy of these vaccines? Very briefly, because we have another pair of questions, please. Right. First of all, I want to express I'm jealous that you have access to five. In Switzerland, I've only have access to two and I have no access to any vaccination unless I become obese or diabetic. <laughs> so um, in, indeed, with, with, with an unorganized chaotic rollout of various vaccines at the same time, vaccine effectiveness studies will be harder to do. Luckily, we do have Israel, which was, you know, a nationwide roll out with a single vaccine and we're getting good data and I don't think we need to re replicate those data. We have good data. I think the, the biggest learning for me was the UK. 
So the UK uh, rolled out the, the mRNA vaccines as well. And then they rolled out AstraZeneca in a massive way long before Europe did. And you may recall um, that both the EMA um, had uh, long issues and long discussions asked for more data because there were not enough data in the older age group. Uh, and we at, at SAGE had the same. So you have a vaccine for which actually you have non-significant, confidence interval included zero, efficacy for the older age group. What do you do? And you have to think about it. Whilst now, meanwhile, the UK has raised the head and used AstraZeneca, we, we took our time. And now you have seen the, 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 the Lancet article that came out, I think last just, just a few days ago, from the UK, actually from Scotland, showing it was a, the 5 million population of Scotland, showing actually in real field conditions, the vaccine effectiveness of AstraZeneca is as high as for Pfizer. And this message needs to come across because in Germany, as we've heard in, in Switzerland, in, in the Netherlands, there's no hesitancy against AstraZeneca. They don't want to take it. They want to take only the Pfizer vaccine. So, so I, I think in, in real life, some vaccines may even do better as now the AstraZeneca did because it does, it does protect against more severe disease. And this is what we care about. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to go for one question with Dr. Franco and then with one question for Dr. Ocolo. Dr. Franco, one question, uh, since we're touching uh, scientific things uh, related to Dr. Uh, um, Wilder Smith was saying, how do you see the potential of having uh, mixed platforms of vaccines to improve efficacy with all these new variants that we're going to be seeing or we are seeing already? And we know there are over 4,000 variants of the virus. Some better behave, some other very bad behave. But how do you see the possibility of mixing platforms for vaccine production? Dr. Frank. Thank you, Dr. Becerra. I think this is a very important question and, and something to take into account. First, we need to consider ourselves lucky that in fact, in a, in a record amount of time, we don't have one vaccine that works, but we have many. So that is a problem or luxury. And now what we are seeing is that the, the virus is dynamic, the virus changes, and we need to, to run at the same speed, if not faster than the virus. And I think having combination, a potential, a potential studies of combination of, of vaccines that could contribute to each other in its capacity to deal with some of these new variants, I think that is essential. And we already have studies in which vaccines like AstraZeneca and Pfizer are being uh, studied in combination. And I think this is going to allow us to understand whether we need better to have a strategy where we use two different vaccines or where we have a booster, a third dose from a specific vaccines that could allow us to, to better tackle those, those new variants like the South African or the Brazilian variant. Thank you. Uh, once we're in this uh, area and the variants and the vaccines and boosters, what about uh, pregnant women being vaccinated against COVID or with any with vaccines? Any uh, mention on that? Yes, we, we, we know. There is a lot of questions about uh, pregnant women and many countries have uh, excluded them from the vaccination program. Uh, the CDC, on the contrary, uh, advocates that women uh, that are pregnant are offered the vaccination and they can't decide by themselves whether they, they apply it or not. We have seen that uh, pregnant women tend to have complications, they tend to have uh, children that are born before the, the expected date. And I think it's important that they are studied, they are being studied, and I think it's important that the vaccination programs are offered also to pregnant women. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Professor Ocolo, we, you show a slide in which Morocco was, had already achieved over 7% vaccination of the population. How can an African country uh, such as Morocco, Northern Africa, share lessons learned on how to do this and how to achieve this to other countries in Africa? Is there any work in progress about it, sir? Thank you very much. And um, if I may also, I'll, I have a little question of my own, which is uh, what I would also want the panel to think about. Yes, we do have uh, the regular Africa CDC uh, meetings where we uh, have all countries from time to time, the ministers of health. In fact, we meet every two weeks, sometimes every month at different fora 
uh, and we share ideas and we share um, um, uh, experiences. And of course, the countries that are doing X, Y do bring it there. That is, however, not operational. It's not really the area where you can say that people would then have to discuss how did they sign up the deal? How did they get the, um, the, the vaccines? And what is it that they have specifically done regarding the logistics for the vaccines? And it often becomes a question of what people do in sub-regional communities like we have in West Africa. Therefore, we can talk about what Guinea did. We can talk about what uh, Senegal is doing. And we can talk about what Ghana did. My question, however, points to the fact of if we have a global pandemic, what do the panel or what do panelists think about? One of the things that sets you upfront in terms of benefiting from vaccines is when you participate in the clinical trials. And if you're participating in, okay, let's even leave phase one, phase two and phase three clinical trials, you are already upfront in terms of understanding what is going to be the likely results because the people who are participating in the countries and the researchers themselves do have before publication and even before it goes to WHO for EUL, which then takes some time. People have already started signing up deals. There are people today who have signed up deals for Novavax. How, how do they know what we don't know about what will be the efficacy of Novavax? But they are doing that as a considered scientific logical opinion because they have that information that this is the way it is leading. When we have TB, when we have HIV, and we're looking at new drugs, we rush to have these trials in Africa. Why can't we also have the same, that vaccine trials during pandemics have to be equitable? And then when it's equitable, it is contributing to the vaccination, but it's also an inroad into being first off the line in terms of having. So South Africa, for example, which participated in Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, got the Oxford um, AstraZeneca vaccine first, but of course, because of the South Africa variant, they now have to give it out to others. So it is really a practical situation and we have to think about it. That's uh, the only question I, I have for the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Okoro. I think that this is a question also of inequalities in terms of uh, uh, research uh, sites in, uh, in African countries, uh, for not only for vaccines, but I think for a lot of uh, medication that is being produced by pharma. Uh, and I don't know if uh, Dr. Gillard, Mr. Gillard, uh, sorry, uh, we already uh, lost, uh, lost uh, Dr. Mr. Thomas Koenig, because that was a question for him, how to improve access of African countries to the uh, clinical trials. But uh, Doctor, if I'm gonna give you, because we're coming close to the closing session, I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds, each one of you, of your panelists that we have here. Uh, we're gonna start with Dr. Wilder Smith, then we go with Dr. Franco, then we go with Dr. De Francisco, who has also a comment to do about pregnant women, and uh, the, uh, we finish with Dr. Ocolo. Dr. Wilder Smith, your final comments, please. We, uh, mathematical modeling has shown, even if you have a vaccine that has a lower efficacy, the earlier you start rolling it out, the higher your impact. So, so I, I urge countries to run ahead of new variants because the only way to stop variants is to have high coverage rates. And so that's, that's, my, that's my main message. Thank you so much, Dr. Franco. Thank you, Dr. Becerra. I would like to add that uh, communication is indeed one of the issues that we have failed the most during the pandemic. Scientists, the public health community, the academics have not been in touch with the population and we have left them alone. We have stayed in ivory tower and I think it's essential that we get out of the ivory tower and we engage with the population and we answer their questions, uh, we answer their, their beliefs, their concerns, and we don't, try, uh, we don't treat anti-vaxxers like people that should not be considered. Everybody's opinion should be considered and we have a responsibility to, to share our academic and scientific knowledge with the population. So I will advocate my colleagues in public health and academic and medical community to engage with their communities and communicate better. 
Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Dr. Franco. Dr. De Francisco, back to Washington. Very briefly on pregnant women, there was a note yesterday that came out in Reuters talking about Pfizer starting a 4,000 pregnant women testing in about 10 countries of different uh, parts of the world. Very important work, pregnant women are very important and are frequently left, left out. And my last message is please, COVAX is the single initiative that is aiming at distributing equitable vaccines around the world. Let's protect it. The more vaccines you buy outside COVAX, the less percentage of the population of all of the countries that are from COVAX are going to be able to receive vaccines. So let's protect it. This is not only for this pandemic, but it's also an important role that might happen in future pandemics, which for sure we know they are going to be coming at some point. Thank you very much. Gracias, Andrés. Uh, thanks so much. Professor Ocolo, your final comments, please. Thank you very much for inviting me. Let us not forget the lessons of where we are now, but what can we do differently with the next pandemic in terms of equity, in terms of clinical trials, in terms of local manufacture? The more manufacturing sites, whether in collaboration and partnership that we have, the easier it is to reach the populations early enough to stop variants. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Okolo. I would really like to thank all of you for your participation. I think this has been a very amazing presentations and panel and discussions. I think that we still have a lot of uh, roads to walk together in terms of research, in terms of uh, deployment, in terms of trials, in terms of new vaccines probably, uh, and, and really making sure that we have more access to vaccines. Uh, this is something that even countries like my, mine have not been able to roll out in the best possible way. I had access before my mother who is 97 years of age. So this is something that the strategy in Mexico and Mexico City has been different and it has been dictated and has been shifting on an ongoing basis. And I think that this is gonna happen in many countries. And I think that all these lessons have to be written and shared with everybody so that we know what's happening and we can share them and improve and have a better vaccine coverage for everybody. Thank you so much. I would like to let my audience know that we're gonna have all the videos of this conference posted next week at, uh, at the YouTube channel and also at the website of the Global Health Consortium of the Florida International University for, uh, where you link to this, uh, to, to this seminar. And I think that this, uh, amazing, amazing discussions in such an amazing time we have been living uh, and that we have been probably seeing more square faces because of the screen than, than any before because, uh, uh, and I know from my colleagues in Pajo from where I, I used to work, that travel was one of the main reasons because face-to-face -face meetings really have a different impact. But I think that with this new COVIDianity uh, that we are living now, uh, and using a video is improving the communication. So as this time we have Mexico, we have Washington, we have Miami, we have uh, Rotterdam, we have uh, Nigeria, we have Switzerland. And it's been amazing to have all of you. And we have, I'm sure that I, we have more than uh, uh, people from all the continents right now. And we thank you very, very much for your presence here. We're gonna move now to the second session